skôr než pristúpime k diskusi s publikom, chcel by som sa spýtať, či niekto chce v našej predstavných hosti reagovať na to, čo tu bolo povedané. I want to agree with uh, Christoph's presentation greatly. I think that one can make a economic defense of markets, but I also think that the moral case that you make is very important. So uh, that's great. Dobre, tak ďakujem pekne, takže asi by to bolo súhlasenie, keby to naši hostia mali reagovať na druhého, tak nech sa páči priestor pre vaše otázky. Chcem ešte teda pripomenúť, že samozrejme, aby dostalo priestor čo najviac ľudí, tak stručne a stručne a zvyčajne na týchto akciách, takže nech sa páči. Ak nikto, tak položím prvú otázku ja. Chcem sa spiať, Chcem sa sa spýtať, veľmi často zaznieva od ľudí, ktorí majú určite namiestky voči klasickému liberálnu výstupom v ekonomike, že trh spôsobuje, že bohatí sú stále bohatší a chudobní stále chudobnejší. Čo by ste povedali v tomto pláne? Rich people are getting richer. I think that's a good thing. So uh, we could all live in caveman times and we could all be poor and make the exact same income. On the other hand, the fact that Bill Gates has you know, $90 billion more than I do, I'm happy about that. I would rather be the poorest person in Beverly Hills where my neighbors are much richer rather than being the average person in Cuba or even the richest person during caveman times. Uh, so I think it's a fun, fundamentally different approach that economists such as my, myself have is that when certain people get richer, they're actually benefiting the rest of us. Uh, Bill Gates has gotten so rich by providing products to the rest of us. Steve Jobs has gotten so rich by providing products for everybody. Uh, so I think the more that rich people can get rich, uh, the better. And I don't, I'm not concerned about relative income uh, inequalities. Uh, let, me, let me just add that uh, it's not very popular, but we have to keep in mind that there is no so-called justice, at least not on Earth. And the so-called social justice doesn't exist. So we have to be frank about that. There will always be the lowest 10%, whether we like it or not, but there will always be a, the lowest 10%. But we have to keep in mind, due to economic growth, due to competition, due to globalization, those lowest 10% have risen and have uh, got into other spheres and they are better off now. So free markets help and create Growth and of course well-being. Very quickly, the total wealth of the Gates is about 93 billion. So it's 90 billion <laughs> wealthier than you are. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, um, I mean, we saw one picture. You presented a picture which was a uh, the best uh, reply to the question that you were asked. It was the picture about Korea. North Korea and South Korea. You have the same people. You have the same natural resources. You have the same environment. There is just a border about in the middle of the country. And in the north, everything is government controlled. Government schools, government kindergartens, government whatever you want, you name it. Huh? And in the south, there is pretty much of a free market economy. And in the north, you had an average per capita income of, what was it, $2,400? Yeah. And in the south, you had 24000 something. 
So, I mean, this is the reply. Free markets create wealth for everyone because the 24,000 was not the top percentage. It was the average per capita income. So, free market creates wealth for everyone. Not the same wealth for everyone, but it creates wealth for everyone. So, we need free markets. Yeah, on the, on the moral issue, I'd like to suggest that um, besides talking about private versus public, you might want to talk about uh, individual versus government and be using government uh, choice and how the government is doing things. And the reason is on a moral basis, what government does is based on force. And the actual reason that capitalism works is not Ayn Rand's greed, but the fact that it's peaceful, voluntary contracts, so that it's a win-win. Everything that is done in capitalism, peacefully and voluntarily, is a win-win, which is why it's going to be two times more, or even greater, than when government does something, where it's always a win-lose. Okay, that's well, um, uh, I could speak English, but I think it's better in Slovak. I'll use Slovak. Mám takú kontroverznú otázku na zamyslenie. Pôjdem to na prípad Slovenska, kde častokrát používame teda jednoducho chceme do ekonomiky zjaviať isté liberálne princípy, čo je častokrát v negatívnom kontraste s tým, čo v akom systéme vyrastala generácia, ktorá už je teraz pomerne stará, ale jednoducho bola zvyknutá na systém akéhosi socializmu, kde teda štát sa postará o vás, je to môj záleg, netreba sa o to záleg. A ono je to v kontraste nielen na Slovensku, ale aj v rámci Európy, a Európskej únie, kde jednoducho je tu akýsi odpor ľudí voči tomu, že do ekonomiky sa zavádzajú isté liberálne princípy, s ktorými ľudia nie sú stotožnení, pretože jednoducho častokrát je to politicky zneužívané. A myslím, že teraz je to ten istý problém, kde častokrát v rôznych politických systémoch alebo jednoducho v jednotlivých krajinách politici zneužívajú, ktoré to tak nepríjemne, nevzdelaného doliča na to, aby ho dokázali nejakým spôsobom ovplyvniť na to, že jediné štátna regulácia alebo štátny systém je jediné ekonomiky, pod ich vplyvom je ten správny. A to má priváza k tomu, že možno či ten volebný systém nie je zlý, že jednoducho niektorí ľudia by ani nemali mať volebné práva, pretože možno svojím takou selfish postojem voči samým sebe vlastne ovplyvňujú to, že častokrát politici vedia, že teraz je trend jednoducho, že government je ten, ktorý sa o vás postará, nie nejaký free market alebo nejaký Adam Smith teória. Takže len takto ma zamyslím. Ďakujem. 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 
And the only way to change that, I would argue, is to educate people uh, about sound economic policies. I don't think it would require everybody to get a PhD in economics or even an undergraduate degree in economics, but it would require people to just abandon some of the most crazy beliefs that people currently hold. Um, you know, just very briefly, again, I mean, yeah, it's, it's always it's always hard to convince people uh, to convince your voters uh, for something. But I mean, on the other hand, I'm always a little bit puzzled about the fact that there are still people who think that back then, in the old days, where you had uh, real socialism, communism that cared for everything, that life was a lot better. I mean, maybe some of the people forgot about how it was, or most of the people nowadays are, or were, back then were too young, that are nowadays uh, in the public uh, sphere, uh, to remember correctly what it was like. But I mean, if you compare, close to, to any of the countries back then that was heavily government controlled socialist countries, whatever it was, the Soviet Union, uh, countries like your country over here, is it Cuba even up to today, is it North Korea, whatever country it is, there is maybe one exception, but still this exception, uh, it holds the point, it's China, because in China they started about, let's say 10 years ago, to kind of develop the third wave uh, between democracy and free market economy. So on the, on the economy, on the side of the economy, they are doing quite well, uh, even so the, the political part is still scattered. But still, if you compare those countries with the most free countries in the world over the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years, is it Great Britain? Is it Australia? Is it Canada? Is it, uh, is it the United States? Is it the Asian Tigers? All of these countries have a by far higher per capita income and higher uh, welfare standards, not welfare state, but welfare standards uh, for the whole, uh, for the, the common good, to, to call it like that, even so that's again a philosophical term, but the common good is by far larger in those free and most free countries than in the former government controlled countries. So, whatever comparison you would take, um, freedom, free market systems are better off. Um, and, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hard to to communicate truth. It's not so easy to communicate truth, but I mean, yeah, we are here for, I mean, like a conference like that is here for opening the eyes to some of the people. Most of you have open eyes already, I guess, uh, and you like these principles already, but there are people out there who have never heard about it, and, and you're here, and I'm here, and we all are here to go out and to tell the people. It's not only on the politicians, it's, it's on, on us. So. Let's give them, let's remind them back to the old days and let's give them the comparison. I just recall, I just recall there was a, uh, there was a state visit, I guess it was Brezhnev, or was it Kushin? No, I guess it was Brezhnev in the United States. And uh, he wanted to, to see a supermarket. I don't know who told him that, but he wanted to see a supermarket. So he went to the supermarket, it's a real story, you know. He went to the supermarket together with the US president and then he said, oh gosh, I hope my fellow citizens back home will never see that. Because if they see that, we have immediately a revolution with just the supermarket. One out of how many thousands in the U.S.? Uh, I'll be brief, because I'm pragmatic. It's just actually the facts and figures that will sooner or later lead us to this question. Also, when, when, when will we hit the wall? This was uh, the last panel's question as well. So let me quote uh, Lady Thatcher on that. In how long can we afford spending other people's money? And that's it. And I think we are very close to seeing the end to that. Yeah, but there is also a danger. Now we have a little discussion up here. There is also a danger because our governments are smart. I mean, how long can we afford to spend other people's money? as long as our government bonds, our T-bills, are purchased by whoever on the market. How long, are going, they are, how long are they going to purchase? As long as they have liquidity, free liquidity that needs to be invested somewhere and at least get a couple of percentage points on it. 
So our governments are smart. They are producing money. They are producing uh, additional liquidity like crazy. They, they, they doubled and tripled and quadrupled the money supply in the last five, six, seven years like crazy. So there is a vast liquidity in the market that is still there to buy these government bonds. But if you would now lean back, uh, smile and say, well, then we're not that bad off. You and I, we all are going to pay the bill because it's inflation. If we're producing additional money, if we're widening the money supply, then it's inflation that's going to kick in sooner or later. And it's already there. Only in the last quarter, agricultural products all around the globe, prices for agricultural products were up 25%, only last quarter. There was a, an article published recently, just about two days ago, in one of our newspapers, where they said the ECB, European Central Bank, is raising the inflation forecast from 1.9% to 2.5%. And two paragraphs later, it says that all the experts are very much skeptical about this figure because purchasing prices at supermarkets, again, supermarkets, you see, I like supermarkets, purchasing prices for the average household for supermarkets within one year were rising at least 7%. So it's all about how you compile the basket with which you uh, measure the inflation. And this is just total stupidity, what's done over there, you know? So the real inflation is by far higher than the official figures that you're seeing. And if you wanted to buy an apartment or a house 10 years ago and now, then you'll pay double or triple the price. This is part of the inflation. If you wanted to buy something in the supermarket one year ago, 7% more today. And if you bought it 10 years ago, it's 30, 40% more. I mean, this is real inflation. The value of your money is shrinking. And so you are paying the bill. Ivan from Conservative Institute, tiež dostane radšej pri Slovenčine. Nadiazali som na ten príklad Severnej a Južnej Koreji. Aj v Európe sme mali podobný príklad pred viac ako 20 rokmi. Východné Nemecko a Západné Nemecko. Vieme, ako to skončilo. Komunizmus v Európe skončil, Nemecko sa zjednotilo, ale nejak veľmi som nevedel túto udalosť interpretovanú ako víťazstvo slobodného trhu. Skôr mám pocit, že, že kus toho nášho socializmu sme si zobrali zo sebou do Únie a že Únia, Európska únia aj... aj Západné Nemecko nejde smerom k voľnému trhu, ale skôr k tomu k tomu sociálnemu štátu. Čiže chcem sa spýtať, aký váš názor na to, že ani, ani toto, čo by sa mohlo interpretovať ako víťazstvo voľného trhu, trhu neviedlo vlastne k tomu, že by sa presadzoval presadzovalo voľný trh, ale naopak stále proste viac a viac ľudia alebo politici túžia po takom nejakom všeobývajúcom sociálnom štáte. I definitely think you know, things go in good directions and bad directions, so you can interpret it uh, both ways. On the other hand, uh, there are, on average, in the index, improvements in uh, economic freedom over the past 20 years, and it is in large part due to a lot of the countries in Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, I obviously would agree with you that Europe is not as libertarian as I would like or you would like. Uh, so it's certainly not perfect. Um, but I do think that maybe in the long run we, we need not be so pessimistic uh, to follow up on your question of, of transmittal of ideas matter. Um, you know, we can look at other disciplines and, and say 100 years ago things were a basket case and people have improved. So maybe like the study of hygiene. We all now brush our teeth, we all use soap. This is a great thing, and maybe 100 years from now we'll all understand economics and understand the benefits of economic freedom. In general, I'm always very optimistic. But then my friends invite me to panels like that, and then I'm always very pessimistic. <laughs> um, 
because I, I see some facts. I mean, <laughs> yes, it's true that some of the statistics are improving, but it's because of the former communist countries, which was 50% of Europe, are now free economies, um, developing out of where they came from, and therefore this is raising uh, the statistics or into the positive. But in the West, and at some point also here you will see a turning point, uh, but with us it's already turned, it's turned 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and I would absolutely agree. I mean, we are on the road to socialism. I would say it's socialism through the back door. Um, again, the example, if more than, up to more than 70% of, of the money that my employer pays for me is consumed by the government and net into my pocket, it's about 30% 30, 30 that I'm receiving for what I'm working for. My American friends, whenever I'm telling them about that, they're always saying, oh, we didn't know that you were a communist country. I mean, it's quasi-communist. If you know that 50% of our GDP each year is consumed by the government, we just found out uh, about half a year ago that our four, five, five political parties in our parliament are receiving more than 300 million euros each year. Or whatever, I don't know. 300 million euros. I mean, it's, it's outstanding. Um, about our, our GDP is about 300 billion in Austria. 150 billion is consumed uh, by the government. We have 8 million inhabitants. Since I know these figures, I'm always asking myself why our streets are not gold-plated. Because this is done every year, you know? 150 billion is every year. No, not, not in 10 years or 20 years. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not a good situation. If you look at the, the Eurozone, I mean, there is a reason why finance ministers are panicking and hiding behind closed doors, even not telling the public that they're meeting uh, at all, and they're meeting and they're debating what's going on. I mean, there is a reason for that. Um, we are, they, they try, they, they manage to maneuver us at the brink of disaster. And we will see what's going to be next. Um, we'll definitely have very high inflation. I mean, everyone, just remember back one year ago, everyone was saying stupid. Whoever talks about inflation is just an idiot. I was always talking about inflation. Back then I was an idiot. Maybe I still am, but now everyone is an idiot because everyone is talking about inflation. So, um, I mean, that's, it's just weird. But yes, uh, your assumption is quite correct. We are heading towards uh, socialism. Well, the alternatives are inflation and inflationary fault, and uh, what is happening right now is uh, the pendulum is unfortunately swinging back again, and uh, the so-called uh, liberties that we have seen in the early, well, at least in early or mid 90s, early 2000s, uh, are being cut and are being reduced. I mean, we have more regulation, no matter whether it's and that the so-called CO2 and our environmental frame is now, with the financial crisis, they are starting to create new regulation. We have uh, increased spending, government spending, we have interventionism, we have uh, more bureaucracy than ever, um, and we have a debt wagon that is uh, going and running and as you mentioned before, the politicians are hiding behind curtains and don't tell the truth. I'm not very optimistic. <laughs> kapitalizmus, alebo nie, záleží dosť zásadne od otázky, či vie si vykreovať myšlienku, ale následne aj efektívnu prax o alternatíve. Tretia cesta, ktorá sa tu hľadá, pozme od 60. rokov, aj v bývale Československo, sa o to pokúšalo, mocensky to bolo zlomené, neskôršie, alebo paralelne Jugoslávia sa tam niečo podobné pokúšala, ale tam bol zase, tá, tam bola zase podpora 
podpora zo západu pre investície, čo samozrejme im, im robilo podporu pre ich ekonomický rast. No a teraz Čína, ktorá bola zmieňovaná. Ale tak či onak na všetkých tých prípadoch vidíme v konečnom dôsledku, že je tu triblovanie na jednom hokejovom ihrisku, keď je ľavý mantinel, je fenomén moci a pravý mantinel je fenomén kapitálu alebo peňazí. Ľudstvo za 5000 ročnú históriu urobilo, urobilo predsa konkrétnu skúsenosť. Starovek a stredovek boli organizované na bázi moci. Novovek sa zlomil a začal experimentovať s peniazmi a s kapitálom. Skončilo to tým, že kapitál sa stal novodobým a moderným orga- organizačným nástrojom ľudstva. Výsledok bol, že kapitál a peniaze, peniaze ako ekonomický kyslík a kapitál ako organizačný nástroj ľudstva, dokázali vytvoriť veľmi pohyblivú sféru pre činných. No ale to, viete čo, skúsme to zredukovať a, naozaj, že ja otázky a niektoré slovy, tak ja to zvrniem do jednej vety. Ja to dovolíte ešte, no. ešte poviem, ja, ja, ja skončím. Chcem tým, chcem tým povedať a vlastne aj to moje vystúpenie je vlastne podporné voči tomu, čo tu bolo povedané. Proste je veľký kardinálny problém rozmýšľať nad nejakou alternatívou. Kapitalizmus má svoje nenudy, ale bez kapitálu a bez peňazí dneska nevieme efektívne ekonomicky fungovať. Dobre, tak aby som to zhrnul, existuje tretia cesta medzi kapitalizmom a socializmom, prípadne niečo ďalšie, vidíte to reálne? I don't like the term capitalism, you know. Uh, this is a term that was invented by Karl Marx. Um, maybe you should uh, refrain from that a little bit. It's a decision between the freedom of individuals and coercive power by governments. This is the decision. And as I said before, and I want to remind you on that, we are created as free individuals as free human beings. This is our nature, free decisions. This is our nature. And, and the government, the more the government is building up, the more regulations, taxations, whatever, the less or the, 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 the smaller our freedom is going to be. And this is the alternative. Individual freedom or government coercion. And I vote for individual freedom. Capital is just one part, one part of the game. But there is a lot more at stake than just capital. I, I agree with the uh, previous comments, except for my endowed chair is the study of capitalism and free enterprise, so I have to use the word. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I do think it's this choice between the two things. And to disagree slightly with the China example, I would actually argue that most of China's success is because of markets. It started off horribly. Millions and millions of people were dying. They were starving to death. And now they've moved significantly away from that. Uh, there's private enterprise, it's not perfect, but if you compare China now to what it was just a few decades ago, I think it's a tremendous improvement uh, in, in the well-being of the people there and the well-being of the rest of us who now get to consume their products because of capitalism. Uh, so I think that you know people are going to always try and present this third way, um, but I think we economists need to point out what good that happens in the world is because of markets, because of voluntary interaction, because of peaceful interaction, and it's not because of the state. The state, in my view, is just a big parasite, uh, and we want to eliminate that whenever possible. Ďakujem veľmi pekne, ďakujem našim hostom, ďakujem aj vám, vážení diváci, a poprosím vás, máme 10 minút na prestávku do ďalšieho panelu.